everybody. I'm Chris Carberry, CEO of Explore Mars. Welcome to the Humans to Mars webinar series. Our webinar today called Realizing Mars Diversity's Critical Role in Achieving uh, Mars Exploration. Obviously, this is a really important topic today. And But before we get to the introduction of our moderator, I just have a few quick announcements. Um, as you may have heard, the Humans to Mars Summit will go virtual this year. It will be taking place on August 31st to September 3rd, and we will be opening up registration again next week. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a really incredible program, and it'll be done over four days this year in the virtual format. Uh, we, are also, we also have our dates for the 2021 Humans to Mars Summit, which will be May 11th through 13th, 2021, at the National Academy of Sciences building. That won't go on sale until we'll probably launch that registration around the time of H2M this year. So take a layout, stay tuned for that. Also want to thank some of our Humans to Mars Summit sponsors, including Aerojet Rocketdyne, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, ULA, <clears throat> Paragon, MDA, National Institute of Aerospace, uh, Two Planet Species, and several other sponsors we'll be acknowledging throughout this webinar series. Also, if you have enjoyed these webinars, first of all, thank you for the, everybody who's made donations. But if you like these webinars, please support us as well in the future because uh, they're, they're not cheap. We li love doing them, but we have to maintain the, the quality uh, and the um, number of these events. So anything you can do would be greatly appreciated. And if you're interested in sponsoring, please contact us at info at exploremars.org. Thank you. Now it's time to move on to our webinar, um, uh, Realizing Mars Diversity's Critical Role in Achieving Mars um, Exploration, moderated by geoscientist, analog astronaut, host of Space Snacks, and recently elected uh, member of the Explore Mars Board of Directors, Dr. Cyan Proctor. So Cyan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, it's my pleasure to be the moderator of today's really important discussion. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce all of our amazing panelists, and then we'll get to the questions. And so first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Shauna Pandya. She is a scientist astronaut candidate with Project Possum, physician, aquanaut, speaker, martial artist, advanced diver, skydiver, pilot in training, and a VP in immersive medicine with Luxonic Technologies and a fellow of the Explorers Club. She is also director of the International Institute of Astronautical Sciences, Possum Space Medicine Group. She's the chief instructor of the IIAS Possum Operational Space Medicine course, chair of strategic directives for the Possum 13, a clinical lecturer at the University of Alberta, session organizer for Ascend 2020, and was most recently named a medical advisor to Orbital Assembly Construction and United Space Structures. Dr. Pandya holds a bachelor's degree in neuroscience from University of Alberta, a master's in space studies from the International Space University, completed the Entrepreneurship Graduate Studies Program from Singularity University, and has a medical degree from the University of Alberta. She is currently completing a fellowship in wilderness medicine from the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. Welcome, Shauna. Thank you so much for Edward having Gonzalez. me. Edward Gonzalez began his work in Pasadena, California at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 2001 in the capacity of business administrator in the former Office of Education, now the Office of STEM Engagement. Mr. Gonzalez also worked directly with NASA headquarters in the capacity of education and public outreach for the Science Mission Directorate with a focus on planetary science. In 2011, he started to co-manage and coordinate various programs under NASA's Minority Undergraduate Research Education Program and has been a keynote speaker at numerous universities and community colleges across the nation, as well as a panelist and moderator for various national STEM conferences. He was a detailee at NASA headquarters in 2008, working on the background development and training for the staff at each NASA center 
on the OEPM metric and evaluation database. He completed a, he completed a fellowship at NASA's headquarters in 2014-15. He now resides on the East Coast and is the Outreach STEM Engagement Lead for Diversity and Minorities at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, as well as the Network Lead for NASA's STEAM Innovation Lab. He mentors dozens of students and is passionate about his work and enjoys helping others. He loves to spend time with his new wife, enjoys reading, traveling, and is a lifelong learner. Uh, welcome, Eddie. Thank you. Shatoria Palmer, also known as Toria, is a fifth year aerospace engineering major at Auburn University. She is a NASA solar system ambassador and aspiring astronaut. Her passions are rocket propulsion, space exploration, black holes, physics, thermodynamics, and mathematics. She is currently conducting research in nuclear thermal propulsion. Her goal is to be a propulsion engineer. Welcome, Toria. Welcome. J.R. Edwards serves as staff within the Chief Technology Office and Executive Secretary for the Corporate Technology Advisory Group of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. Mr. Edwards is well known across the NASA enterprise. He has been a longtime senior liaison to NASA headquarters and the U.S. Department of State, and he supported Lockheed Martin's Government Affairs Office in advocating NASA programs on Capitol Hill. His portfolio includes human space flight, science, aeronautics, and technology programs ranging from the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, NASA's flagship of the Human Exploration Program, to Hubble Space Telescope and historic Mars missions such as the Curiosity rover. He managed the payload for Orion Exploration Flight Test 1 and led the integration team in meeting critical milestones ahead of schedule and below cost. Mr. Edwards is credited with setting the vision and managing Lockheed Martin's model partnership with NASA via the Space Act Agreement Strategic Alliance for Education and Public Outreach. His lifetime achievements include election to the International Academy of Astronautics. He is on the honorary board for the Space Generation Advisory Council. He is a lifetime member and associate fellow with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And he recently was elected 2020 fellow of the American Astronautical Society. Welcome, JR. Good to be with you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have everybody here here to have this um, important discussion. And I want to start off by talking about education. Education is the roadmap to a career in space. And over the past few months, we have seen the hashtag Black in the Ivory go viral. And it brought awareness to the challenges people of color face in pursuing higher education. Now, I know I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the degrees that I've gotten. So I wanna start off our conversation talking about the challenges you have experienced or are experiencing while in the educational system and how did you success successfully get through it? Um, what tips you know, or strategies did you use? And so I wanna start with Shauna on this question because Shauna, you bring a unique perspective being international and uh, you have even more degrees than me. <laughs> Shauna, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, thanks so much for the question, Slan. I, I have a few thoughts to share on this. And you know, I, I know um, your question specifically asked about higher education, but I, I also want to put, pay mind to the importance of representation starting in grade school. So my own personal experience in grade school, I grew up in a very, very suburban, um, type of neighborhood. Um, so that meant I remember looking around once in grade four when I was nine years old and realizing I was the only um, non-Caucasian person in my class. Um, and you know, later in life, so when you're growing up, the, the, the childhood that you have is your only normal. So you accept it as normal. Um, and you just think that everyone's upbringing is like that. And it wasn't actually until maybe earlier this year when I was comparing notes with my other um, friends of color that, you know, if you had a goal, you didn't think about the barriers, you just set your mind to it. Um, and things are, things are different today because we're just 
you know, we're taking, we've started to take those blinders off and we're starting to see all the barriers that exist. And for me, it really hit home when last year I was giving a keynote um, at a STEM undergraduate function for, for women in STEM. So it was undergraduates. And at the end of the talk, this young lady in engineering of Southeast Asian descent, she came up to me and she very deliberately said to me, seeing someone like you up there of the same background as me makes me realize that I can do it. And that was really my aha moment that representation matters. You know, we need, you cannot be what you do not see and what you do not know. Um, and that's why for me personally, it's become so important you know, even if it was a normal normalcy of childhood, being the only one, it doesn't need to be like that. And so that would be, you know, my, my, my first thesis is that representation matters and we need, we have a duty to, to help uplift everyone. You know, what you're saying is, oh, I have feedback there. Um, it, is that gonna? You're good. I, I hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, what you say really resonates with me because I grew up the same way. My parents made specific educational choices on where we lived based on education, which put us typically as the only minority uh, or person of color in our educational system. Do any of our other panelists have a serious, a similar experience growing up? I see Toya shaking her head. Um, Eddie, what about you? What, what challenges did you face in the um, K through higher ed system and how did you overcome that? Well, well let me, let me uh, phrase my sentences this way or, or what I'm thinking. When you are a child, obviously you're with your family and you don't have a choice of what community, what city, what state that you live in, you are with your family and you roll with them. However, as you're becoming a rising senior and you're getting ready to pick schools, I think that will help navigate and make things, I don't wanna say easy, but better. If you don't necessarily pick the first school that might give you a full ride or uh, a school that um, is um, known for, for the major that you're taking, you gotta take other things into consideration. Um, what type of community is it? Do you feel comfortable in that community? Do you have allies in that community? Um, you know, STEM clubs, things that you're gonna feel comfortable because you're gonna be on your own as you're going through the academic, uh, academia process. So I think it's important, and the message that I wanna give is when you decide, think of city, county, state, allies, you know, places of worship, what have you, you need to take all of those things into consideration to have the smoothest ride possible to get to your destination. That, you know, thinking about what you're saying is, I never thought of any of those things or I didn't even have that conversation with my parents. Uh, and Toya, you're more recent going in. Were these some of the things that you considered when choosing to go to Auburn? Most definitely. <laughs> Auburn is a small, small town. <laughs> the only thing that's known for is Auburn University, and we have a few stores around there, and that's about it. It's, it's, oh, it's, Bo Jackson, too. <laughs> well, yeah, but he, <laughs> you barely hear about him. But um, no, I, you know, just like Shauna, I, I grew up, well, not actually just like Shauna, I was actually relating to the to the um, being the only minority in the group, but I grew up in a small town, um, up north of Auburn so um, it was it was I, I grew up in a predominantly white city so I went to a predominantly white high school predominantly white colleges and everything like it, it, it was re, it was it's 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 amazing how white places can be when you don't really when you're trying when you're like paying attention if you if you get what I'm saying I'm sorry I'm stuttering a lot this morning but Auburn is predominantly white um, the challenges that I have faced is being the minority in the group and making sure, making sure my voice is heard. Um, with that, it, it comes with difficulty because the stereotypes is I'm the angry black woman. So <laughs> that's not, you know, I, I have always been an opinionated person. If you watch my t Twitter, you'll definitely see you have some opinions every single day, but, you know, being, uh, you know, living in Auburn, 
and making sure that I get my degree as well as making sure I'm participating in the right things that interest me that I'm passionate about, you know, like Rocket Club and STEM Club, making sure that, you know, that they're in good locations. Auburn is a definitely great location. Uh, the most you'll get out of that is just like f bad fans, but that's about it. But, it, you know, just like Mr. Edward said, you know, um, picking the city and the allies and everything else, those are definitely good things to look for when you're looking for the right kind of education. I kind of went two different directions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's fine because one of the big things that we, 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 we want to talk about is finding your voice and yeah. feeling comfortable speaking it because I, you know, when you talked about the angry black woman and so the stereotypes that come with, you know, people of color and what does that mean and, and how do we address that and overcome that. And so JR, do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure, if I can start by, by just first um, expressing thanks to um, Explore Mars uh, for today's session. Um, I, I really uh, celebrate Explore Mars, um, very sincere and genuine interest in bringing diversity of voices together um, to talk about um, our, our experiences. Um, so this is really a special treat for me. So thank you very much. Uh, I am a, I'm a native a Midwesterner and uh, my, my family um, um, settled in Indianapolis, Indiana, on the, the outskirts of town. Um, and, and I am just uh, three generations removed from, from slaves and ex-slaves. And, and this was a community in Indianapolis um, uh, that settled on 20 acres. Uh, there were two tracts of land. Um, each were 20 acre uh, tracts. And they were owned by uh, two different uh, white men um, who decided to sell the land very cheap uh, to former slaves. Uh, this was in the 1890s. Uh, so a community of African Americans, uh, Blacks, um, caught wind of this and uh, decided to settle on the outskirts of the city and, uh, and to work the land. Um, there was nothing on the land, uh, so they had to build their houses. Uh, they were earning pennies uh, a day at the time. Um, these were not lavish properties, um, but they were sort of pioneers in their own regard. Uh, and they created a wonderful community, uh, a community. And in fact, um, my family still resides on the land there now. I'm not sure if you can see this photo, but this is a photo of our, um, the Sunday school group uh, from the 1950s. And my mother is actually on the far left uh, of the screen. Uh, she's holding a satchel that's running across her shoulder. Uh, so it was really a, a very wonderful community, um, but what, what transpired is that as you had this group of Blacks that had settled far outside the city, you had this great migration of Blacks that were coming up from the South, up the Mississippi, after slavery in pursuit of a better life. Um, and uh, many of them settled in urban centers. Uh, so you had this influx of Blacks in the city center, and then you had this tiny little enclave <laughs> of ex-slaves who had settled outside the city. Um, so let's fast forward. Um, we, 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 we moved through the civil rights era. Uh, we hit the 1980s um, and we, we are now confronted with how to integrate schools. So we had all the black kids who are now being bussed out to the suburbs. Um, and, and I grew up in those suburbs uh, on that farmland. And one of my earliest experiences in school uh, was my mother um, having to, um, to to walk to the school um, and, and have words with a counselor in the school uh, who was refusing to admit my little brother to the college track curriculum. Um, so what, what was very common uh, with integration is that black kids would be bused into these schools, but then they would be put on technical tracks. And these aren't the technical tracks one thinks of in terms of technicians who work our programs, right? Uh, these were non-college prep tracks. Um, so, so therein you had these disparities that were already starting to manifest even after we thought we were free. And, and some of those really uh, continue to persist to today. So, um, so th those are some of my early memories of, of realizing that, you know, I, maybe there is something a little different about me. Um, and, and how do I navigate this, um, take pride in where I, who I am and where I'm from, but find a way forward in spite of that. You know, you bring up a, a lot of good points, and one of them was family and family expectations. 
I know for me, my, neither of my parents had college degrees and education my, from, I don't remember my dad ever saying that I was not going to college because my father saw that as the, the equaling playing field. You get a degree, you've got a chance at the life you want to create. Um, but even getting into higher education, you know, there are all of these, especially in a STEM field, there are all of these added kind of microaggressions or barriers that you just don't even realize. And my parents didn't realize that because they hadn't gone through that system, um, but they were barred from kind of even getting into it. And so what role did family play with you in supporting you through making these decisions and going off to college? Because I know that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that, that influence. Does anybody want to just chime in? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> um, like you, uh, Dr. Sian, my parents did not go to college. Um, I don't think they even finished high school, I believe. But, I mean, they are very very smart individuals, but they definitely pushed me to go to college. I mean, they pushed me. <laughs> it was a push every single day of every single year. I had to make A's, and I posted this a few few days ago. It was like, I could not make below a 90 at all. <laughs> I would make a 90 of each. My mom, my mom would be like, oh, that's 10 more points, and you would be a superstar. I'm like, uh oh, I didn't just make an A or nothing. <laughs> that's why I'm a perfectionist now. <laughs> so um, me, my mom, and my dad have definitely pushed me forward. They wanted to see me be an engineer. They're so excited for graduation next May. They're more excited than I am, and I'm very excited. <laughs> so, yeah, they definitely pushed uh, where they didn't have those opportunities that I have now, uh, which are still limited. Um, they definitely pushed me forward. You know, and it's interesting that you're saying that because I know that, um, Shawnee, you've gone and you're continuing to get degrees. You're off, all, always learning. And I know that that's um, a motto for the rest of our panelists, too, of this lifelong learning. And so what role has your family played in your educational system and the way you think about education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cyan, kind of throwing back to my earlier point, you know, what you grew up with is, um, you know, what you know and what, what's your normal. And so like, like Toya's family, you know, achievement was not a question. Um, and so um, I learned of this really powerful principle last year, and it's called family science capital. Um, and the, the reason this, this conversation came up is I was um, keynoting at the Canadian Association of Science Centers. So all the heads of the science centers were there and I, I struck the conversation with one of the heads of these science centers. And, you know, I was saying when I got into medical school, I was just blown away by the amount of medical students who came from families of doctors. And it was just dynasties of doctors. Um, and for, for context, my brother and I are the first in our family to go on to medical school. And so we always get asked, you know, where your parents doctors? And I never understood that question until this idea of family science capital explained to me. And basically, um, the children who are more likely to go on into STEM careers are the ones who were exposed to STEM, science, technology, engineering, math at home, you know, whose parents may have careers in that field. Who may take an interest and engage them in science experiments. And so um, the reason that that becomes important, you know, goes back to, to JR's point from earlier, you know, we're, we're keeping people of color, for example, from getting access to that capital, well, then we're keeping them down from accessing the system. And so we need to acknowledge the types of privilege that we now have in our lives. For example, Cyan, you've alluded to this, education is a great leveler. Education is absolutely a privilege. But then we have to say, how do we facilitate that privilege? How do we give others access to this, this capital, this, this, this science, this science education, and to higher education in general? Oh, absolutely. Uh, JR or Eddie, would you like to say anything? Uh, JR, I'll, I'll let you go, and then I'll, I could finish up. Sure. You know, I am. Um... I, my family instilled in me very early on a keen sense of understanding who I am, um, where I am, understanding my environment at all times. And, and part of that is driven out of this African-American experience of, of servitude. 
Um, and, and, and that that really is a manifestation not only of, of the pain and suffering of the slave experience, but also our, our deep spiritual ties um, and, and how we find ways um, to look beyond what might be immediately in front of us to think and, and envision about what might be possible for us. Um, what was interesting about my upbringing is that um, I didn't realize that, that Blacks held positions of leadership in city, state governments um, until I moved to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and it was eye-opening uh, for me. Um, but, but what I really treasured is that um, my family's strong focus on education, on reading, on learning, on listening, and understanding, it, it really paid off so that when I made that leap and I ventured out into the broader world, all of those things I learned as a kid really helped to advance me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Eddie? Wow. Um, I did things way backwards. So education was not something that was pushed in my family. I was actually a very good student uh, up until um, the winter of um, my seventh grade year. And my father passed away on Christmas Day. And after his passing, my mother went into a severe depression and I really didn't have any contact with her for about three years. So I had to do the best I could to get to where I needed to be. Um, and it was tough. I was very, very angry. Um, I was getting pulled over as I was driving to school uh, my junior, senior year. I would get pulled over three, four times a week for driving under the influence of Brown. So by the time I graduated again, I was very angry. And then something happened. I got my girlfriend pregnant. This was the summer uh, after graduating. So I did everything backwards. I ended up getting an entry level position at a law firm. And when I left there in 2001, I actually uh, climbed the ladder to uh, be part of senior staff. I actually worked for Warren Christopher as a coordinator uh, during the Christopher Commission right after the Rodney King incident happened. So I got to do a lot of really cool things. And then schooling, which is much different than it is uh, back then as it is now, um, I would take a class here at Pasadena City College in Pasadena. I would take a class there just to keep going, just to keep learning. And as I mentioned, I'm still a lifelong learner trying to get it in when I can. You know, you bring up such a, an important point um, because my father was the same way and he actually took some classes at Pasadena City College but I have my father's uh, certificates of just courses he had taken and he had done a lot with NASA and with the Apollo program and this whole idea of how we get educated and what does that mean and and what type of certificate do you need to hold or versus knowledge and ability to show that you know you've got what it takes to be successful and a lot more emphasis these days are put on the need to have that university degree or even higher education and and so thinking about the fact that in stem and space we we get these degrees and then we think that that's going to open up this door to the, the career we've dreamed about in the space sector. And, and then what we find is a lot of times when we get out there, the realities of the world we face is filled with, with discrimination and sexism and competition and wage disparities and all of these things. And I, I know people who have left their profession because of these struggles. And so thinking about how we how do, what have you learned out in the workforce? Um, what kind of experiences have you had? What are the road, roadblocks and challenges? And how do you advance your career? And for Toya, I want you to think about how, what the career you want to have next year when you graduate and the, the type of, of corporation that you'd want to work for. And so um, I'll start with uh, Eddie, how about you? Um, you know, some of the challenges, and thank you for the question, um, from a cultural standpoint, and again, this is strictly my opinion coming from me directly, um, sometimes when you get a promotion or you get that internship or you get accepted to that school, you start looking around at the dinner table and not everybody's a fan, not everybody's on board because they feel that you're going to leave them behind. Same thing with your friends. 
So now once you get there, I think one of the biggest challenges I had is typically I would be the only minority in the room. And if so, imposter syndrome would kick in quite often. But then I had to remind myself, you know what? I will find the solution to a problem. If somebody gives me a problem, I will, I will solve it. it. It doesn't matter how long it's gonna take, how much research I, research I need to do, I'm going to do that. And I just have to remind myself that I'm here because I'm supposed to be, and I belong here. But again, one of the biggest challenges all the time is imposter syndrome. And then again, from a cultural standpoint, having fans on the sidelines and quote unquote haters as well, even sometimes coming from your own family because they don't want to be left behind. So you have to focus and say, this is where I'm going. If you want to come with, fine. If not, I'm going in that direction. Wow, so much you say resonates with me, especially the imposter syndrome. I, I kind of live in that world a lot and uh, being the one. And I think the rest of our panelists can definitely um, resonate. This resonates with you. Uh, Shauna, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, as you may have heard from my bio, I've had the luxury of being ensconced in numerous um, amazing sectors and disciplines, medicine, space, um, technology development. And, you know, I would say in medicine, um, where, you know, you essentially grow up in your ad young adult life, um, so you're, you're pursuing your medical school, um, your postgraduate training, um, growing up as an attending physician, um, you know, there's so many experiences where, you know, as a medical student, you may not have power or feel you have power um, to say anything because you're being evaluated at every single turn, even as a resident. Um, you know, the, the, unfortunately, the culture of medicine is such that, okay, well, you're smart, therefore, you know, maybe you have exception or license to say things that may not be politically correct. But when you look back on it, they're frankly quite sexist and racist. Um, and you know, you get to a point in your career where you say, you think to yourself, this isn't okay anymore. And you know, I may have had to go through this, um, but it stops with me because the, the cultures that we accept in our workplaces are a reflection of ourselves. It's a hall of mirrors. And so if something isn't right in your, in your workplace and you're accepting it and it's still going on, that's a reflection on you. And so for the way that's translated for me going forward into medicine in particular is just point blank, not on my watch. None of this, none of this will happen. No microaggressions, no, no sexism, no racism will happen on my watch. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new attending. Um, so when someone like a learner, a medical student, a resident is under my watch, you know, it's, it's easy to look out for them. Um, but the other part of the equation is starting to look out for yourself because even as an attending, microaggressions from colleagues um, and more so from patients um, don't stop. And it's a very tricky line to navigate because it's a respectful relationship. It's a professional relationship. But that doesn't mean you should have to endure um, inappropriate, racist, and hurtful comments. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So much to think about there. Um, Toya, what about you and your thoughts on your future career? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, most definitely something to think about is um, my future after graduation. And I've had a lot of time to think about it, which companies I wanted to get with and where I want to be in the long run and which challenges I was going to phase going forward as a black woman. Um, definitely want to be a propulsion engineer. It's something I'm really good at. I always love rocket propulsion. Everything about it is just wonderful. <laughs> um, I have always had that love for rockets and space exploration and everything else. But when I know, just like Shauna says, you know, tolerating the things that have already been there and getting there and changing it is definitely something that I wanted to do with different companies. I'm um, not going to start <laughs> start off the one <laughs> I, I spoke with you on Dr. Science, but um, companies, you know, like NASA that are trying to change diversity, you know, it's, it's one thing to say I want it to change and another thing to say it's going to change and it's going to happen and it's going to encourage 
younger generations that's younger than me to want to work there and want to be astronauts as well. So, I mean, we have to create a healthy environment, like um, Ms. Sean was saying, that is inviting. You don't want to just be like, oh, here's a bunch of you know, pale faces, and here's Shaitoya. Here she is, she's talented, but she gets looked over. That's not that's not something that I want. I shouldn't have to fight for a spot to get heard. So <laughs> that's, I have great ideas. I have great research. So just look at it, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that's just, you know. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. And um, JR, I know that you've had a long career. And so what are your some of your insights I've really appreciated hearing all of the panelists' comments. Uh, you know, coming from the corporate sector, uh, we, we tend to do a very good job of finding talent, early career talent, recruiting them in from universities, um, but then they hit that three to five year period um, and they hit a wall. And the challenge becomes, how do you move this wonderful talent through that entire career evolution, through mid-level management onto senior level management opportunity? And I've had it described to me um, from those outside of the space sector who are working in other industries as, as akin to being on Celebrity Apprentice or a survivor. Um, it's who's going to get voted off the island first. <laughs> and every day you feel the intensity of that competition. And you know that you have to bring your A game. And not, not only must you bring that A game, but you must perform and deliver against the backdrop of all of these, as Shauna mentioned, the, the microaggressions, the environmental factors, um, those obstacles that you know from your upbringing, that they are going to be out there, um, and, and you will have to find, your, find a way to navigate through them. So it, it's critically important to, to find those allies, as, as Edward mentioned, and to uh, think about those individuals who might be sponsors and mentors. Um, it, it's good to get the education, that's critical, <laughs> that gets you in the door, but how you then navigate that environment becomes sort of the second phase that may launch you into those higher level opportunities. You know, that all of this stuff is so important, what we're talking about, and thinking about the workplace and these microaggressions, Shauna, what you were saying about not on my watch. And, and the thing about it is a lot of times it's, it's the minority or the person of color who has to take the stand. And when we're thinking about cultural institutional changes, how do we, you know, what kind of takeaways or advice can we give to maybe our audience when it comes to supporting diversity and inclusion in the workplace and and to be mindful of the microaggressions and also uh, the challenges that people of color face while trying to you know we we really have to perform more than 100% all the time because I feel like anytime I do one little mistake that that's it, I'm going to be, you know, uh, called out or thrown out or something's going to go wrong. And but we also are pitted against each other because usually when you're thinking about climbing the ladder and they're looking at diversifying, well, they want one person of color. And so who's it going to be out of the people below? And so we fight for that position. Women fight for those positions. And so we've really set up this culture of, like you were saying, JR, of competition uh, in the work workforce. Uh, does anybody want to jump in on that one? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, Sian, you, you raised some great points. And I think, it, you know, it comes back to the fact that we're all learning, um, you know, approach, approach um, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity with humility. Um, don't be afraid to correct. But that means in turn, when someone corrects you, um, approach it with humility um, and, you know, accept the correction with grace. And go forwards, and you know, I, I like to think I'm fairly um, approachable and, and an ally. And I actually recently had a patient correct me um, because I was using the term African American, and she said, um, "Well, no, I'm I'm either of African descent or I'm African Canadian. I'm not American. So you either should refer to me as Black, African, 
Canadian or of African descent. And, you know, I, I turned beet red. Um, I was embarrassed, but I thanked her for the correction. Um, so we're always learning. Um, but also, you know, being willing to have that courage to correct others. And as you alluded to, it, it can be exhausting having to perform your job, perform at your best, but also take on the additional mental burden of trying to level the playing field for yourself and for those who come after you. Um, but it is, there's a need for it. Um, you know, the past three months have shown us that, you know, that if we want to pers- progress with relentless forward progress, um, we have to be willing to fight the fight. We have to be willing to put in the effort and we have to be willing to build those allyship um, and draw in our allies and educate um, and also forgive. Um, you know, Toya related, uh, alluded to the, the, the stereotype of the angry black lady um, at the beginning of this, um, you know, and so many of us, you know, in, as we progress in our careers, it's easy to be jaded um and frustrated by what we see and that's where you know the power of compassion and grace and forgiveness comes in because just holding on to that anger that frustration um you know hurts ourselves just as much as it hurts everyone else so um that would be my advice for progressing forward wow Wow. that is is um compassion grace humility uh does anybody have anything to add to this eddie yeah, actually, I took quite a few notes on this. Um, so, for example, if a colleague or someone says, um, like, I, I made this comment not too long ago, if I need milk and it's 8.30 at night, I really need to think, do I need milk that bad? Because what if I get pulled over? Anything could possibly happen. So I've got to think about that. So um, some of my colleagues and friends that says, okay, I am not familiar with that. Um, I do have a sense of privilege that obviously you do not. What are some of the things that we can do to help and support? And I want to lead by example. So I I will do these things as well, which is stand up for what's right, especially when those in need are pushing back against what we've normalized, what we've said, this is a normal thing. And it's not. So we need to be able to do that. Um, Silent agreement doesn't change anything. We have to speak up. It's so important. Um, some of the other things that we can do as well is to change the uh, level of the playing field is let us not keep our contacts and our network in our pocket. We need to share those things and not be afraid of competition because believe me, at the end of the day, all of us are going to get there. And if somebody gets there before me, well, maybe I didn't work hard enough. So I think it's important to share opportunities, um, networking, all of that. It's so important, it's gonna make us all stronger. Um, Also too, let's just say that I am authoring something. Maybe I can ask somebody, hey, doctor, you know what, you have an interesting code. Maybe we can adapt that into mine and you could co-author with me. Bring you with me, you can come. There's room for all of us. Um, Or again, as um, I'm here today, ask, would you like to be a speaker? Would you like to be a moderator? Let us get us all out there. And I think that's important and key. Oh, I love it. Uh, access and inclusion, bringing, up, bringing others along with us yes. and, and asking for um, help also. And so yes. JR or Toya, do you have anything to add? You, you, you know, it, one of the reasons I, I was so excited to join the board of Explore Mars is that um, the vision of, of Explore Mars really resonated for me. Um, as we are thinking about uh, human civilization, civilization living and, and working in space, um, Explore Mars realized that we've got to get it right here on Earth <laughs> uh, to get it right in space. Um, so we're still thinking through these things, um, but but these all of, all of the topics we're discussing today um, relate directly to our goals for exploration and how we will engage as spacefaring a spacefaring species. That's really exciting. It's exciting now to take the the richness of these experiences and to think about how we might live in a different environment, completely different from what we're experiencing here on Earth. Um, So I just wanna send that shout out to the Explore Mars team um, and and to each of you as I celebrate your stories um, and the challenges that you've endured and how you have navigated those challenges 
to, to build really remarkable careers. That's fantastic. Toya, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I loved everybody's point. It's, I, I don't have a point actually, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I have a question that I think JR leads eloquently into this. And we have the unique opportunity to create the future of humans beyond Earth. What are your hopes and visions for the future? Let's put it in the context of what would you like to see us look like one year from now, considering we're in this Black Lives Matters moment. And so one year from now, what would you like to see um, humans thinking about and acting? And then five years from now, and then 20 years when we hopefully have boots on Mars, what are some of the things that um, your future, your vision would incorporate? Toya, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> Um, most definitely, I hope that we are changing from a year from now. <laughs> right now is a bunch of protests. Um, thankfully, rioting has um, calmed down a little bit and um, everything with the coronavirus. Hopefully, we are out of this pandemic by next year. We don't know because um, many aren't wearing masks and many are, and that's creating a kind of division with the, um, the medical way of going forward. Um, what I want to see is, and I'm going to relate this to racism because that's something that I've dealt with nearly all my life with how I grew up and where I grew up and everything else. Um, I would like to see us progressing forward, um, but somehow we are progressing backwards. So um, I feel like time was always meant to, to repeat and that's what it's doing. So it's hard to change a repeating pattern if nobody understands what's the problem. What, that's, the, that, that's the thing that's going on. Nobody understands what the problem is and nobody's willing to listen to what the problem is. So we have to have a listening ear. Um, me, I was telling my husband, and I've always been an empathetic person, somebody who's um, just empathizes with people who don't really deserve empathy. <laughs> um, I have always been like, you know, if I see somebody do something bad, whereas the, 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 the normal person would be like, oh, they're bad. I don't see it as black and white. I see it as, hey, maybe something happened to them that caused to do something like this. I'm like a cause and effect kind of person. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, so what caused you to be this way? And whereas where I think it's racism is a generational thing. I mean, basically, people are teaching generations that's a generation. If it doesn't stop, then it's never going to stop. So that's where I would like to see us a year from now, just like change and realizing that Black lives do indeed matter and we do deserve to live. <laughs> I don't know why we need to convince the world of that, but <laughs> we do indeed deserve to live and to thrive and to be successful, have those same opportunities. But like Dr. Science was saying, I have to be twice as good just to get half of what <laughs> the normal person has. I have to be, you know, the GPA has to be twice as good. I have to have more network or networking people. I have to have more opportunities to get where, hey, they can make a call and they can immediately work as the engineer that they want to be. I have to be, you know, almost three times, four times as good. So that's just because I'm, I have color on my skin. That's just because of how I, was, how I was raised and everything else. So I would like to see more opportunities for people of color as well as black people, as well as LGBTQ you know, plus community being accepted into the communities and um, the education that they want to, and as well as creating that environment, inviting environment that they want and we want as well. Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Eddie, is there anything you'd like to share? Well, some of the hopes that, that I have, uh, there's two things that are not taught, um, is the fear of falling and loud noises. Everything else is taught. So I'm hoping because of what's happening right now, that the generations to come are going to know better. They're going to have a better heart. And that some of the things that a lot of us are facing on the daily won't have to go through that again. You know, I look at my children and my grandchildren and I, you know, I, everybody wants a better life for them. But for our nation, our nation is not where it needs to be right now. So I hope a year from now, we are starting to make progress. Five years from now, we have made serious progress. And then 20 years from now, we can look back and say, wow, 
what a time that was, but look at where we are now. We are in a great place right now. And that's my hope. Thank you. Shauna? Yeah, thanks for the question, Cyan. So I would say a year from now, I hope that the, the wave and the momentum that we started in the past three months here continues that, you know, it is the growth of a movement to not the flash in a pan in history, um, that it sparks genuine change, that people who may feel outraged that systemic racism is still as prevalent as it is today and that as we unfortunately unveil more, it's layers upon layers that we continue to be as, as outraged that it exists in its present state in 2020 that it does, that we be as committed to, to dissecting this, to um, deconstructing the chains of um, systemic oppression, microaggression, racism that have existed for as long as they have, and that we build up something more positive, inclusive, and productive going forward. Five years down the road, I hope that translates into a reflection of society at all um, levels, whether it's our politics, whether it's our STEM field, whether it's our educational system, um, higher education and otherwise. And finally, in 20 years, I hope that it translates into, um, as you say, us being on Mars. There's this saying that don't do it for me without me. And so if we're going to Mars for all of humanity, don't do it without all of humanity. Bring the men, but bring the women, bring the people of color, don't bring just the pilots and the engineers. Bring the storytellers and the artists. Do it for all of humanity, with all of humanity. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, JR? Shauna, I am all in. <laughs> you, you, you really articulated that so well. Um, you know, when we talk about diversity uh, from a technology strategy perspective, I, I sit uh, within our chief technology office and have the great privilege of working with really amazing leaders. Um, and they're on the leading edge of, of envisioning and, and, and taking us places um, that, that uh, I tell you, it's, it's really a phenomenal experience. Um, but to get there, uh, we need to ensure that we're creating an environment whereby the very best of ideas rise to the top and receive full consideration. And, and that's regardless of any type of, you know, of age, race, gender, uh, any classification, we want the best ideas. So how do you create that environment? So there are a number of, of really uh, candid and, and crucial conversations happening across uh, C-suites and, and boardrooms now in, in light of Black Lives Matter. Um, how do we leverage this moment now to move the ball further and create that environment? I, I have to, to share with you that, you know, those words, I can't breathe, um, they, they cut to my core. And many times through my professional experience, I've experienced those moments where I felt that I couldn't breathe. And how many of us, regardless of our background, um, have felt that way in some manner? It's tough. It's really tough. So it's important that we continue to have these conversations uh, to get to know each other and, and then start thinking about, well, what are those actual steps that we can take to create a better environment for all of us? Um, I, I would like to point um, everyone to a couple of resources. Uh, there's a group called Surge, um, showing up for racial justice. It's getting a lot of uh, publicity now. They have chapters across the country. Um, but this is primarily driven by Caucasian Americans who are saying, hey, <laughs> we want to be allies and, and, and we are now getting together because we realize that we, we need to take some ownership in this. Um, and, and then there is a wonderful scholarly research being done out of MIT, um, out of their uh, uh, Space Enabled Group uh, led by Dr. Danielle Wood um, in the Media Lab. She also holds a dual appointment um, in Aero Astro there on, on um, justice um, and how to design systems that are anti-racist. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, how phenomenal is that? So and she was very much ahead of this entire wave. Um, so, so there's a lot of good work being done, um, but I, again, thanks to Explore Mars for having this conversation. I look forward to supporting other conversations. Um, as each of us are going back to our different organizations, look around, let's, let's take a real honest look. And if we're sitting in meetings and everyone looks like you or sounds like you or shares your point of view, 
that might not be the most healthy environment uh, for, for your organization. So um, thanks again, and uh, I really enjoyed being a part of this discussion. Well, thank you um, to all my panelists for their uh, amazing insight. I'm going to go to some questions from my audience now. And so the first one is from Jess, uh, who's age 11 from Virginia. Were you ever bullied or ridiculed for your likes, dislikes, or anything that you did or said? If so, how did you overcome those? I have had a lot of bullying in my life, so I have bumps that really slow, really slow me down, and I absolutely love space. What can I do to overcome those bumps? Eddie. Let me, uh, I'm gonna try not to be too long winded about this. Uh, when I was eight years old, um, I was picked on, horribly picked on. And uh, when I was eight, my mother took me to the park and she handed me what appeared to be a baseball glove. Now, mind you, I had never played baseball before in my life. So she brought me to this park, they put a, a number on me, and then I had to go out into the baseball field and catch a grounder. Now, mind you, I'd never played before. So I looked at the kid in front of me, he put the glove down and it went right into his glove. Well, when I tried to do that, the ball rolled up the glove, split my lip open, and now I'm bleeding. But I had to continue on with this process of trying out. So what ended up happening was I was picked last. I was the worst player in the league and I was bullied horribly even at school. So what I had to do was turn that around and I dedicated myself to learn how to play baseball, to learn the fundamentals of baseball. And I practiced and practiced and practiced. And the next year I was one of the best players out there, but it was with a lot of work and a lot of, I'm going to do this so I no longer get ridiculed or bullied or any of that. It was a quest that I took and it worked out for me. Thank you for sharing that, Eddie. Does anybody else have something to share? You know, growing up, I definitely went, um, was bullied a lot. If it wasn't for my glasses, it was just how, you know, I made good grades or I was a goody two shoes or whatever. Anything that they could have called me other than the N-word, <laughs> I was definitely called. Um, I became, I was a band nerd, so I played piccolo in marching band, and we had about 200, 300 people in band. And they would be calling me just band geek and everything else, or, you know, like, they always said astronaut geek, and I, I'm starting to think, that's not even an insult. I'm glad to be an astronaut geek. <laughs> You know, and I found out that the people who had the most to say were the ones who felt jealousy and who weren't where you were. And, you know, you start, you start to see the people now as I've, you know, gotten to two past degrees and now I'm on, on my third, you know, they didn't go anywhere, but they had a lot to say about me. But I mean, you had the same opportunities I did. You know, and you could be great just like I can. It's, 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 you know, it's the getting through it is knowing that you're, you are, can be successful. You can do anything. You know, my mom always taught me you can do anything. She always related scripture because I'm a preacher's kid. So, <laughs> you know, I, she always related uh, scripture to it as well. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as well. But, you know, I, I've always related God to my, my success as well, but not everybody does that, of course. You know, I'm not trying to force God on you guys, but I'm just saying, you know, you can do anything and that's what helps you get through those tough bumps. Donna or JR? Yeah, um, thanks, Lynn. And Jess, first of all, I'm sorry that you're going through that. That's never fun and it's tough. Um, the other thing I would kind of um, echo that's been said is, be proud of being a space geek. You have found something you love. Embrace it. I was the exact same every single day of grade seven. When I was 12 years old, I would cart around these books about the universe and astronomy and um, uh, black hole formation. You found something you love. There are so many of us out there who are just like you. So you have begun to find your niche because you're among us. Um, keep looking, 
find the science clubs, the space clubs, the books, the YouTube videos. There's, you, you found something precious. You've just found the string though. You have to keep tugging at it until you unravel that passion more and forget the haters. They're, haters are going to hate, honestly, but you found something special. So keep, keep digging at it. Uh, so true. Uh, the people like us are waiting for you. So we're out there. And so sure. they're to support you. JR? You're muted. I will just echo what Shauna said. Um, space is cool. Engineering is cool. Technology is cool. Um, we are the it thing right now <laughs> in many ways. Um, and, and there's a fascination with the work that we're doing and, and a, even a greater appreciation than when I started my career years ago um, in the public psyche. So it's a great time now uh, to be part of this community. Um, and, and now let's think about how we can bring others into the family as well. Oh, absolutely. And so I want to go on to the next question from Jazz. Um, and she writes, how do we deal with microaggressions at work when they are brushed off as jokes and management are either guilty of the same or don't care? Oh, I have firsthand experience with, with that. The little um, jabs, the, you know, uh, <laughs> you turn your back for a second or it's brushed off as a joke, but it's at your expense. Any thoughts about that? Actually, Sen, I want to hear how you handled it. Uh, you know, I, I asked people who were in my support network to stand up for me. Because one time, sometimes it happens in front of you, and then you can stand up. And I started calling the people out. And I'm like, well, that wasn't funny, you know, and, and actually saying things. But when, it was hap when I heard about it happening in meetings that I weren't, wasn't a part of about me, directed about me, um, I asked people who were there and I said, well, did you say something? Because you're the one telling me you're my friend. And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, next time, please say something. And so I started to see them speak up a little bit more. And I even pointed it out to management and said, you know, one of the things that I'm really de dealing with is the fact that, you know, people are, have this microaggression. And I can't say that, the, I mean, management was like, what well, we support you, we're here for you. And they acknowledge that they, it, that it happens, but I also know that they don't do anything when it happens in front of them. And so um, it's still an ongoing issue. You know, that's an excellent point. Um, when we think about the, that experience with the officer um, and the knee on the neck, and, and we think about those officers who stood by and did nothing or or did little um that's a challenge to all of us um when we're in these different environments when we hear those things to have the courage to step forward um and to do so you can do so in a way um, that's very respectful um but very direct um and and sends a clear message that that this does not reflect the best of who we are um, so I, I fully agree with you saying it's important to tap into that support network, to think about those allies who can be influential, even as you're addressing the energy directly. Right. I would Shana? say, in my opinion, it's, it's also a bit of a progression and kind of based on my experiences over the years, um, you know, the first time something egregious happens, you say nothing because you feel powerless. Um, the next time something happens on repeated occasions and you escalate it, um, it's easy to, you know, they, they, these things can be brushed off because no one wants to rock, rock the boat. And also coming back to the importance of why representation matters is who you're complaining to may be part of that, um, you know, old school architecture, that old boys club, whatever. The next time it happens, you know, if it's extensively documented, um, you know, you have records, you have notes, and you escalate it, um, and it's still brushed off. Um, keep escalating. So it has to, you know, keep notes, keep receipts, build your allies, and then also in the longer term, work to build up that that representative workplace. Because if you're 
For example, in my experience, always complaining to the cis, Caucasian, hetero, male um, person in power, when those are also the microaggressors or outright aggressors, um, it's easy to see why it's brushed off and not taken seriously. And this just harps on the point of why it's so important as we go on generationally to bring in those different perspectives and those different, uh, the, this culture of inclusivity and diversity, because um, that's how we help build this empathy and in turn create a workplace that's equitable, where everyone is empowered to succeed and perform at their best. I love what you were saying. Um, uh, Eddie or Koya, do you have something? Uh, I was just going to mention, uh, I agree with, uh, with what you're saying in regards to your colleagues need to speak up. It's really important. Um, you know, silent agreement is nothing. You've got to speak up. You've got to have the courage to do so. Um, and I know that, uh, at least I'd, I'd like to think that I have uh, throughout my career, uh, that I've always stuck up for those that may not have a voice or they feel that they don't have a voice for, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think it's important to speak up. You have to. Otherwise, nothing's going to change, and, and we need to do this. You know, when I think about that and the whole idea that speaking up, a lot of times, like what you were saying, um, Eddie and Shauna, is that you tend to get separated from the group then, and you get labeled, and all of these things happen. And I love, Shauna, what you were saying about documenting uh, what the issues are. And, and it, because a lot of times we don't do that and then it builds and builds and builds and then we leave because, or we find a way out to get out of that situation. Um, and, and then when you leave, you kind of might tell people, well, this is why I'm leaving, but it's still, you, you don't necessarily sometimes see change. Um, JR, do you have anything that you want to add or Toya? Um, most definitely, I agree with all of your points. Um, speaking up is definitely important. Um, people aren't mind readers unfortunately <laughs> so they're not going to know what's going on inside your head um until you speak up and say something especially if they have something rude or disrespectful to say speaking up and because disrespect if they feel like they can disrespect you once then that's where the pattern the cycle keeps going on so i've always been one to be outspoken and um, tell you, hey, you need to calm down with your racism and you need to, well, not really calm down, you need to stop with the racism, but if you choose to be racist, at least choose to be racist over there, just not towards me. You know, um, it, it's, it's saying that, hey, I feel uncomfortable with the things that you're doing and I feel uncomfortable with the things you're saying. I feel uncomfortable with the things you're coming to me about. I, if you're choosing to make me uncomfortable, I mean, make me uncomfortable in my space on a continuous basis, then that's when we have a problem. And that's when I need to go to the higher ups and be like, hey, this is a problem. Either y'all solve it or I can go get a job somewhere else. So, you know, it's, it's speaking up and being like, you need to respect me and you need to respect my colleagues and you need to respect people of color you need to respect people who aren't like you you know people see somebody that's not like them they immediately jump on the the wagon of i need to bully and i need to be petty and childish and say anything and everything hopefully it gets a reaction like no we're grown <laughs> this isn't the playground anymore this is this is real life um we're all adults or you know, try to be adults on a daily basis. I try on a daily basis. Sometimes I'm not. <laughs> but, um, you know, on a, we all learn and we are all expanding our knowledge on different things. So, you know, making sure that we're in a comfortable and healthy space and environment that's also really inviting, just like I've been saying. So, unfortunately, I do have to cut this early because I have an emergency with a family member down home. So I'm going to have to cut this early. But I appreciate everybody for inviting me and I appreciate the discussion. I hope you guys have a great day, all right? Oh, thank you so much for joining us, Toria, and for sharing your insight and wisdom with us. I wanna say that, you know, I was taught not to speak up and, and to share my voice. And you inspire me and give me courage and uh, power, empowerment. 
And so thank you for all that you've done and will do. All right, it's great to meet you, Toya. Thanks, Toya. Hope Bye, Toya. <laughs> Um, JR, do you have any words that you want to share on this? Oh, what, what Toya was talking about really was struck at the heart of building those critical relationships and having those conversations. And, and I'd just like to add to that, this is a moment of accountability. Accountability to each other, accountability to our institutions, holding our institutions, institutions accountable to us. Um, there, there is collective power in this moment, and it's really an exciting opportunity for all of us. Um, we have another question from uh, Adrienne, and it's, what hope do you draw from our current day issues and the conversations it's generating? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I have, I think maybe it's come across that I have this, this mixture of hope and cynicism. Um, cynicism because I, you know, this can very easily just be a flash in the pan moment in history and could just as easily dissipate like a wave. Um, or I have hope because this could turn into a lasting um, movement with tangential, positive, lasting change for all the echelons of society. And so my hope is that any, my, my hope, is, I have hope currently because we're having these conversations. We're facing uncomfortable truths about, um, you know, the way our society has been constructed. We haven't quite touched upon it yet because um, so much of this has been focused on what's going on in the U.S., but in Canada, we face an unfortunately similar situation with the treatment of Indigenous people within the country. And, you know, that's kind of our national reckoning, along with Black Lives Matter, that's happening now. So my hope for the future is that each and every single person tuning in today, that's the first positive step. You care about this issue. Um, and you care enough to, to listen to what the issues of the day are. You care enough to add your voice and your questions to the conversation. And my hope going forward is you set your own expectations and goals for yourself um, as to how you're going to contribute to being a positive change agent and then create a plan to, a plan to keep yourself accountable. Um, and, you know, metrics for yourself to measure how you are keeping yourself a positive force for good um, and how you're contributing to positive impact going forward. So that's my hope for the future. Oh, I, I love it. Eddie, do you have anything to add? I think well, we love JR. Um, I would just like to co-sign uh, what Shauna said. I mean, her words and all the questions that you've answered, Shauna, are amazing, really. Um, and again, it, it's my hope that this is not a flash in the pan, as she just stated, that some positive change really comes out of this. And I know that for myself, a lot of my colleagues and friends um, who have, quote unquote, that privilege have told me, I don't know, and I can't imagine what it's like to go through some of the things that you've been through, but they want to learn and they want to help. How can they help? And it has been, considering everything that's happened, it has been a breath of fresh air for me personally. Um, in regards to what NASA is doing, uh, my immediate team, they are there for us. And I really appreciate that. It really makes me feel that there is hope. Well, I love what both of you are saying with, you know, be an agent of change and be accountable um, and think about that. We have, um, a few questions and Janet writes, what can we, your allies do more of better and how do we support people of color more visibly vocally? I think we kind of touched on that a little bit um, just a minute ago, but is there anything else that you wanna add? Yeah, I would say that this actually, sorry, Eddie, I keep going first. Um, no, 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 go right ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, obviously, I have some thoughts on the matter. So I would say, um, you know, be audit yourself, um, be willing to accept criticism. And then, you know, look for look for discussions to partake in some very simple um, tangential, uh, sorry, tangible, concrete steps you can take is, is, you know, giving everyone the respect they deserve. So for example, um, one of my one of my best 
friends and teammates from previous missions and analog environments is, you know, I, I hold him as the model um, of, of emotional intelligence and as well as allyship. And, you know, he's, he's that cis white hetero male, but he's, it, it, you know, he is the bastion of, of building allyship. And, you know, he goes in above, above and beyond when he's addressing, um, in a professional context, when he's addressing a fellow professional, he uses their professional title. And particularly if it's a woman, you know, it's so easy to see that microaggression where someone, you know, I could be in a room with a different physician and the, the male counterpart will be Dr. Smith. And then I'll be automatically relegated to Shauna. Um, you know, and it's sort of like, well, why, why does that professionalism standard change? So simple things like that, you know, give, give people the respect they deserve. Um, and then when it comes to auditing yourself, just ask, how can I make this better? So the first question is, is the current situation ideal? And if it is, um, amazing, tell us what you're doing that you have an ideal situation. Um, and if not, ask yourself what needs to be better and how it can be made better. Eddie? Eddie? I'm gonna repeat some of the things that I had said from earlier, which I think is really important. And the question is, how can I help? You can help by, again, introducing people that are in the struggle to your network. Um, consider a co-author of something that you're writing. Um, you know, lead by example. Um, don't be the silent agreement. Say something, uh, speak up. Those little things right there are very helpful. Um, also, too, and I appreciate the comment of auditing yourself, maybe you have some sort of speaker series every summer, every fall, and take a look at the speakers that you've chosen in the past and reconsider that and maybe bring some speakers of color that can come out and do an amazing job. So those are my things that people can do to change things. Uh that was fantastic. And one of the things that we're talking about just kind of leads off of what you just said, Eddie, is kind of next steps. When we think about um, opening up this discussion a little bit more, and I know that we have some other members from Explore Mars here, but moving forward and thinking about this as a series of conversations within Explore Mars and how we can ensure diversity's critical role in achieving Mars exploration. You know, where do we go from here? And I think one of the big things is language and how we define equity, equality, inclusion, and diversity. And so do you or any of the other people who happen to be on our call um, have anything to say about language and mindfulness when it comes to language? I, Shauna, you kind of hinted at this a moment ago with your colleague. Eddie, go ahead if you have any thoughts. And then no, I'll no, go, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, language is so important. Um, and for example, you know, in, in the space exploration world, we're seeing the evolution of terms of, of manned flight to crude flight um, for all mankind, for all humankind. Um, and, you know, the question is, you know, it's just a word, but why does it matter? Because, um, and, you know, even, even I, when I initially heard this, you know, you know, had, had to check my internal filters and say, well, I never, never perceived that as a slight against me, but it is acknowledging that those internal ba barriers, um, you know, favor certain people and certain um, demographics and um, strata of humanity above others. And that's why it's important to, to evolve. You know, um, humanity as well as individuals are continually evolving and our language must evolve to keep up um, to, if we truly are to work towards that vision of what we aspire to be in terms of progress, knowledge, exploration, inclusivity, and diversity. Yeah, I, I definitely feel the same when we're talking about language, but also visually, you know, what do we see and what are we hearing? Those two things, very powerful messages. And I, I kept remembering when we did the Launch America and watching and visually um, what I was seeing and I and just kept thinking, hmm, this isn't as diverse and, as in, and inclusive as I would like this 
message to be, especially where we are now. And I don't know if you also had that same feeling, but I know I felt that way. Um, Eddie, do you have anything to talk when it comes to language and I think uh, what Shauna had said earlier um, really resonated with me as well. I, I do a lot of uh, presentations and talks and workshops and things of that nature. Um, when Shauna, you had said that somebody said, you know what, you gave me hope, um, you know, looking at somebody um, that has made it, that is very successful and that looks like me, I could do that too. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to do personally is to tell everybody, if I can do this, you absolutely can do it. Um, and again, as you had mentioned about the language, I think that's important to parents. It's important uh, what we stand for. It's important. Um, and I just hope, as Shauna had said earlier too, that we are going to make and we're going to see some major changes coming up soon and it's all going to happen in the right direction. And I do have hope for that. I do. Um, I, I think this is a really important conversation. I want to bring in some more people from Explore Mars. So I'm going to ask Janet and Chris to maybe chime in. And do you have any thoughts that you would like to share uh, at the last few minutes of our broadcast? For me personally, it is, I just want to say thank you. We at Explore Mars recognized that there were some very great areas where we could improve. Uh, we're so delighted to have you and JR on our board of directors. We also just want to be part of really solving uh, some of these issues and addressing these issues and being that space advocacy agency that loudly and clearly states that the diversity of everything is critical. And so uh, there's some notes here in the chat about those quieter, more introverted voices. Uh, there's a lovely book called Quiet, the Power of Introversion that maybe for some of us who can be loud and more dominant in conversations could all learn a few things from and read from. Most of all, I think we just want to say we are open, we are listening, we are here, we want to be inclusive, we want to make space in it as inclusive as possible. When I'm talking to students, you heard from Jesse, I just heard from Jesse's mom, so I want to let you guys know that the, Jesse is very encouraged. He had to leave, I believe, already, but uh, she said it was the perfect webinar to invite him to today, so thank you. You have encouraged an 11-year-old in Virginia. Um, but I think that's my heart is that as I hear you speak, I just you know wanted you to know that there are those of us standing and beside you, alongside you, and we want to better understand, better advocate, and most of all, be, be that agent of change to say, please lend your voices here. We want to learn together so that we can make those children that I'm speaking to and you guys are also inspiring that their generation will take, will think of humanity just as that, as humanity, not any particular thing, color, race, religion, or creed, but that we are all one in that sort of beautiful overview effect. But mainly, we just wanna say we're here, we're learning and we're listening. Thank you. Chris? Oh, yeah. First of all, thank you, everybody. This has been a great panel. And I, I, one thing I've been shocked at over the last few months with this panel, you know, how naive I've been. You know, I've known, of course, of racism in the society, but I've just been shocked by all the stories I've heard, all the, all the problems, all the challenges. You know, I've heard the stories, but never quite in such, such graphic detail. And then as we were, as all these developments occurred, although we've been trying for many years to create diverse programming, and I think we've done, we haven't done it perfectly, of course. There's always been problems, you know, we, we can always improve. We also started looking at our own leadership structure and realized, my, 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 we all kind of, well, we had a fairly good over the last few years we'd managed to solve the male-female ratio within the group 
you know, we realized the group was largely white and that we did have very little diversity, even though we'd been promoting it, you know, within our programming for a number of years, it just was not reflected within the group. So we really, as a group, decided this was the right time that we could probably pay, play a re leadership role, figuring out how to do this, not just in the programming, not with just adding um, folks to the leadership, but just creating programs like this to have conversations, figure out, you know, what's the best path forward. We don't claim to have the answers, of course. I think the best way of doing this is having these conversations and then figuring it out. Like, as you mentioned, next steps. This webinar here is only intended to be the first of many programs, webinars over the next year. We don't know what they're going to be. We want the people participating to define what they're going to be. We know we're going to have a session at the Humans to Mars Summit, which Cyan, I believe you'll be moderating again. But what will that be? What does this group think would be the next best step after this conversation? How can we move the discussion forward? Not only to help explore Mars as an individual group to help um, improve how we operate, but also how we can help the entire aerospace community to embrace this message and basically lay the groundwork. So I think as Shana was mentioning, as we, you know, humanity goes to Mars, bring all of humanity, you know, to Mars. I think that's a great message. And frankly, we'll probably may want to steal that message as we're rewriting our, our messaging with Explore Mars. This is another thing we'll be doing over the next few months is rewriting our mission and our um, other statements to make sure it's more reflective, not only of what we're doing as a group, but of diversity and what our vision of that future should be. Yep, and I, thank you for all of that. And those of you out there listening, if you have suggestions for our next steps, please write them in the chat or in the Q and A. And, and I apologize to anybody's questions that we didn't get to today, but they are all going to be cataloged. And again, it will help us in the next steps and addressing those things or those concerns or those questions that you've brought to us. So again, to my panelists, thank you so much for uh, being a part of this and uh, starting the conversation. I really enjoyed everything and I definitely learned a lot by this. Uh, Chris and Janet and the Explore Mars crew, thank you for hosting this. Chris, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Uh, just a few last questions. Anybody who's of age <laughs> who would like to come on to our Drinks with Explore Mars tonight, we have um, private astronaut Greg Olson coming on, talk about his time on the International Space Station. As I mentioned earlier in at the beginning of this webinar, we'll be opening up registration again for our virtual Humans to Mars Summit. That'll be taking place on August 31st to September 3rd. And hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll be able to announce our next webinar. Hopefully that'll be next week. We have a couple of things in the work. We just have to complete them. So thank you everybody for coming. Thank you to all of our panelists, spectacular session. And this will just be the beginning of a wonderful series that we hope to do over the next year or so. Thank you everybody.